So, if you got a Bible today, Nehemiah chapter 8, and uh, here's what we're going to talk about today. The joy of the Lord is our strength. We're going to read verses uh, 9 to 18, and I will uh, try my best here to get some light for me so I can read it to you. It says, And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra the priest, and the scribe, and the Levites, who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep, for all the people wept as they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet wine, and send portions to anyone who has nothing ready for this day is holy to our Lord. And do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites calmed all the people, saying, Be quiet, for this day is holy. Do not be grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and drink and to send portions and to make great rejoicing, because they had understood the words that were declared to them. On the second day, the heads of the fathers' houses of all the people with the priests and the Levites, they came together to Ezra, the scribe, in order to study the words of the law. And they found it written in the law that the Lord had commanded by Moses that the people of Israel shall dwell in booths during the feast of the seventh month, and that they should proclaim it and publish it in all of their towns and in Jerusalem. Go out to the hills and bring branches of olive, wild olive, myrtle, palm, and other leafy trees to make booths, as it was written. So the people went out and they brought them and made booths for themselves, each on his roof and in their courts, and in the courts of the house of God, and in the square at the water gate, and in the square at the gate of Ephraim. And all the assembly of those who had returned from captivity made booths and lived in the booths from uh, four from the days of uh, Jeshua, the son of Nun, to that day. The people of Israel had not done so, and there was very great rejoicing. And day by day, from the first day to the last, he read from the book of the law of God. They kept the feast seven days, and on the eighth day... There was a solemn assembly according to the rule. We're going to pray and we're going to examine those verses today. We're going to ask that the Spirit of God would open up our hearts to God's Word and what He wants us to get out of it. Heavenly Father, we just come to you. We thank you so much for for the time we had to lift our voices in praise. We thank you for your word and how you use it to go to the depths of who we are. My prayer today is that as the Spirit of God uh, brings us to different moments uh, as he roots things out of our heart, that we would be encouraged by that, that we'd be challenged by it, but ultimately we'd be pushed to the grace of Jesus, and we would make changes in our life for your glory through the power of your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Last week we left off where the people are hearing the word of God read for the first time in a long time. They are brought to tears. They are weeping. The Holy Spirit's doing something very unique here. And uh, it's somewhat surprising what happens as they're weeping, as they're crying. Uh, Nehemiah steps in, Ezra steps in, and the Levites step in, and uh, they basically are saying, now's not the time to weep. So they stand up and they go, okay, let's stop crying, let's stop weeping right now, because there is a time for weeping. It's going to happen. Next Sunday, we're in Nehemiah chapter 9, and the people are going to be weeping. They're going to be confessing their sins, but it's not now. This was not the day for mourning. This was the day for celebration. It's the seventh month. It's the first day of the month, and for the Israelites... The seventh month is festival time. It's a time of celebration. Forget about your work. Forget about the projects that are demanding a great deal of your time because you're not going to get them done. We're about to go celebrate. And there's all these festivals that are happening. The the Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Trumpets for another, the Day of Atonement will happen. And uh, 
it's not mentioned here in Nehemiah chapter 8 about the Day of Atonement, but it's going to happen. They're going to remember that. It would be unthinkable for the people not to remember that. And we'll talk about the Day of Atonement in a little bit. But right now, Nehemiah is preparing them for the Feast of the Tabernacles just before them. And these are the day, this is the day just leading up to it. So the Feast of Tabernacles was family time. So you're not going to be working, you're going to be spending some time with your family and uh, celebrating this uh, festival. All the children would look forward to this festival, to this feast, uh, because they're camping on the roof of their houses, many of them, for a week. So they're uh, setting up these tents in their, in their square, on their roof, and uh, they're going to eat special foods, just like we do when it comes to Easter and Thanksgiving and Christmas. We have turkey, and we have stuffing, all right? And we have all this good stuff, mashed potatoes, some of those nice sweets like pumpkin pie, apple pie, hit Christmas, who doesn't love getting some fudge or peanut butter balls given to them? Like these people are getting ready for the feast, for this celebration. And of all the celebrations of Israel, the tabernacles uh, was a celebration that was supposed to be joyous. It was a time of thanksgiving. It was a time of remembering the goodness of God, especially as they stop and they remember, oh, remember when we wandered in the wilderness, how God had not forgotten us, how God has not left us. So Ezra, Nehemiah, and the priests get up and they do the logical thing. They get up and they say, people, like stop weeping and go have a party. Now, I'm on this all the time. If anyone knows how to party, it should be Christians. I'm tired that the world has robbed us of the party. Okay? If anybody knows how to celebrate, knows how to party, it should be people who were lost in darkness, lost in sin, and their Redeemer found them, and they're just ready to party. They're ready to celebrate. Like, the, this is what Nehemiah is saying. He's like, all right, here's, here's what I want you to do. Picture, it's Sunday, right? It's a day of rest. Uh, for them, it's Saturday. He, he's saying this. Uh, Go home and take a nap. Yes, all right, thank you. Like, that should be like, praise the Lord. Like, naps are from the goodness of God. Naps are a gift from God. Now, especially Sunday afternoon naps, if you can do it, they're like heaven sent, okay? Napping somewhat during the week, it's a little harder. Like if you're that napper for two hours, you're done. That didn't do you any good. But Sunday, yeah, nap for two hours. It's good. And Nehemiah goes, I want you to go home. I want you to get some rest because tomorrow we start the party. Now, I was thinking about this and I wrote this down. Like, I think what Christians need is some praise parties. We're so negative most times. How are you doing? Well, you know, things could be better. What's going on in your life? Well, you know. Like, what has God answered in prayer for you? Like, do you ever just stop and go, like, I'm going to have a praise party? For some of us, we, we do this alone because we, like hearing us sing and shout praise, some of us would be like, please shut up, you can't sing, etc. But having these moments, like you're just driving in your car and a song comes on that you just go, I'm just going to sing that because I'm having a little praise moment with God. Like I think Christians need to do this more because we're missing out on something that the redeemed should be doing. You might be like, yeah, but Howie, I've been saved for a long time. You know, I'm, I'm one of those old school Christians. So maybe let's go back in time and you're like, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. And you go, come, come with me, church. You always leave me hanging. Rejoice in the Lord always. And what? And again, yes. There should be some life in the church to go, 
Oh, man, you know, I got up today. I guess I came to church. Oh, it's going to be so boring. You know, we're going to sing some songs. Someone's going to talk. I hope he doesn't talk too long. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Like, Christians, we should have some celebration. Like, they shouldn't just be coming in like, shh, how's it going today? I'm doing pretty good. How are you doing? Oh, I'm doing good. Why are we whispering? I really don't know. But I think this is what we're supposed to do in church. We're supposed to whisper. And are we allowed to laugh? Like, like if something is funny, if I laugh, is that out of place? Like, I'm just wondering how this church thing works. Celebrate, rejoice, enjoy Jesus. Like Christians should be smiling. Christians should be laughing, having a good time in what Jesus has done for us. See, Nehemiah gets even more specific. He tells them this, enjoy, enjoy cho choice food and sweet drinks, not wanting to forget those who could not come, he says, and send some to those who have nothing prepared. So Nehemiah's antidote to grieving is to celebrate, and he reminds each one present, uh, do not grieve for the joy of the Lord is your strength oh church the joy of the lord trumps anxiety of the day the joy of the lord trumps the isolation the loneliness we are feeling like the joy of the lord should just lead us to get lost in the party to get lost in the celebration so, so by these Israelites going, we're going to celebrate. We're going to remember what God has done. As they're doing that, they're saying to their enemies like Sambalot, Tobiah, and Geshem, take that. You're threatening us. You're, you're saying you're going to attack us. But watch us. We are going to have a praise party. We are going to make much of Jesus. So center point, hear me on this. The joy of the Lord trumps the feelings of guilt that you have. The joy of the Lord trumps the feeling of shame that you have. The joy of the Lord trumps failure. The joy of the Lord is for the young. The joy of the Lord is for the old. The joy of the Lord is for all of those in between. The joy of the Lord is for men. The joy of the Lord is for women. The joy of the Lord is for children. And realizing this, the people dry their eyes. They wipe away the tears. They blow their noses and they get ready to engage the joy of the Lord. They get ready to celebrate what God has done. They get their choice meats, their sweet drinks. They didn't forget to include those who didn't have anything. They bring them along. They provide for them. And then those extraordinary words in verse 10, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Now in the 1930s, Hitler would take this verse and twist it. It was grotesque. But here's what happens, church. Uh, basically, what he's trying to say is uh, uh, a joy and strength causes us to do something. And he twists God's word, and they do horrible things. But, but hear me. Uh, the joy of the Lord gives you strength. Uh, the joy. Joy of the Lord makes you strong. The joy brings that. Like, think about it. No matter what we're going through in life, when we have joy in the Lord, it just causes us to rise up. See, sorrow paralyzes us. You know it individually. So, so hear me. This is a danger in our church culture. When life hits, when life happens, when life gets hard, and I will speak just as a pastor here. Uh, many people, rather than lean into God and the church, go, I need to take a break. And they isolate themselves. Hear me in this. Here's why this is so dangerous if you're walking through hard times and now you neglect the assembly of the brothers and the sisters. You set yourself off by yourself in isolation for our enemy, Satan, who is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And you are left alone and he shows up and he starts accusing you. He starts beating you up and you are left there by yourself. Whereas if you would lean into the body, 
body of Christ, if you would uh, go to God, if you would get involved with people who know and love Jesus and walk that road, they are here for you. One of the best things you could ever do if you're struggling is draw into the community of Christ. Don't isolate yourself. I get it. You might need some time to reflect, to think. That's fine. But do not neglect this. What happens is we withdraw, and all of a sudden we're gone for a month. We're gone for two. We're gone for three. There are people who haven't been to church or in the body of Christ who would claim Christ for six months, for years. And they're sitting at home, and they're missing out on what the body of Christ does. I'm, I love that we have online church and everything, but it's not the same showing up and engaging people and having people encourage you, even pray with you. The enemy wants to draw you away. He wants to push you away. And here's what happens in our sorrow. When we are hurting, we cave in. We, when we tend to become more reflective inside, you lose the physical energy. You don't want to do anything. Ever been there? What do you mean celebrate? I just want to sit here and do nothing. You have no clue what's going on in my life. And this is why we need some friends who took, remember when Jesus was preaching and teaching and those four buddies took their friend so Jesus could heal him? Like we need people who will walk with us and push us to Christ. So you need the Sunday gathering. You need the church gathering. You need to know people and they need to know you. Do not neglect that. Nehemiah's antidote is celebrate, have much joy. See, these are all symptoms here of grief and sorrow when we start to turn in and we focus more on our hurt, our circumstances. Now let's talk about joy on the other hand. It brings energy. It brings excitement. Just watch the NHL crowd when their team's winning, right? Last night, the Toronto Maple Leafs beat the Calgary Flames 2 nothing, And Toronto fans woke up today like, yes, that was good. And the, if you're a Habs fan, because they seem to be like, it depends who you're talking. we got Leafs fans and Habs fans. And then the rest, we sort of scatter through PI. But for the most part, you either right, bleed blue or red. Uh, so you woke up today and you were like, that was awesome. And when you're winning and you're, you're watching something like that, there's a joy. There's a, an excitement to it. And then we show up at church and we're like, you know, some people came to know Jesus. Wow, cool. Like, think about what we get excited about in our world. We get, and, and I'm not downplaying, I love sports, I love engaging in playing sports, I grew up playing sports, but when I break it down, like some of the sports I played, like I was like, Howie, you ran around and dribbled a ball and shot it into a basket. Howie, you stood at a plate and swung at a fastball, and you got all excited for that, and then when it comes to the things of Christ, many times we go silent. Okay, think about this church. Let this sink into our hearts. Like, there's a unity here. Like, did you drive here today going, oh man, I can't wait to come? I can't wait to get into the Cineplex. Like, like there are people, like it blows my mind right now, but there are people that are like, I just sit there and wait for Wednesday at 6 o'clock because I know the second service is going to fill up. And they're all excited and they're waiting for it. And they're like, if we don't get it right at 6, they, they're texting me at 6.01. How come it's not live? How come I can't sign up? That's awesome. That's so good. And even our 9.30 service is going. I'm like, this is cool. Like people are excited. They want to come. They want to be part of what God is doing in the midst of our church here. And uh, there are things like that that just should excite us. And here's what Nehemiah is saying to them. All right, stop weeping. Go home. Get your rest. And tomorrow the Feast of Tabernacles is going to happen. We're going to do these celebrations of the feasts. And everyone was to feast. No one was to be left out. So take note of the mercy ministry. Uh, you got the joy of the Lord. God has blessed you with much. Go to those who have little and get them involved in blessing the Lord. Okay? This is what Nehemiah is telling them to do. Make sure everyone is taken care of, the poor among you, because the joy of the Lord is your strength. So where does this joy come from? Let me give you at least four different sources today. The joy of the Lord comes from, number one, 
this fact. We are loved by God. We are loved by God. It comes from this assurance that we are loved. Loved by this holy God. Loved by this righteous God. So, what do you think they were to be thinking about as they gathered at the water gate in Jerusalem in that square? Here's what they're to be thinking of. God loves me. Did you just drive here today just going, oh, God loves me. God loves me. I can't wait to show up. I can't wait to be here. And God, here's the thing. Their life hasn't been easy. They've been in exile, many of them, for over 70 years in exile. It's been hard. It's been rough. But now they're back in Jerusalem. And God has disciplined them, but he's been faithful to bring them back. And he brings them back to Jerusalem. And he restores the temple. The walls are rebuilt. The gates are are hung once again, and uh, they were the people of God. Oh, they might be small. They might seem insignificant. They might look very weak, but they were the people of God. Think about this. Many of us struggle with feeling unworthy, insignificant. Does God really care about me? And here's what you need to think about. Right now, in this moment, we are on the little, we live in the little province of Prince Edward Island. We're very small, but yet God loves us. We might feel insignificant and unworthy today, but God loves us. In this nation, it might feel that God has abandoned us, but he has not. He's with us, and he hasn't forsaken us, and he loves us. I've had uh, someone say to me back in the fall uh, in regards to some tough things that people were going going through, uh, basically like people are going to leave the church, and uh, you can have the scraps. And I was like, oh, no, no, no. In God's eyes, there's no scraps. People are created in God's image. They have significance. They have worth. They have value. You might walk in here and you might have had a tough week and you feel unworthy. You feel like, what's the purpose of my life? What am I doing with my life? Hear me, God has it all planned out. God thought you were valuable. God thought you were worthy. God thought you were significant. So much so, he sent his son Jesus from heaven to earth to die on a cross, be buried, and raised from the grave for you. Before the foundations of the world, he thought of you. He knows you. He loves you. Oh, church, if that doesn't wake you up in the morning with some excitement, I don't know what will. To know that I'm unconditionally loved, to know that I'm already accepted, not because of what I have done, but because of what Jesus has done done like come on like that should just light you up inside and you should go oh it's so worth living for Jesus it's so worth walking with Jesus see in Jerusalem they had all these tokens of God's love for them his care and providing for them prom keeping his promises with them giving them his word see strength comes from knowing that we're loved and that we're loved by God, that God hasn't forsaken us, God hasn't abandoned us. He's keeping true to his covenant, to his promises. He hasn't broken his promise. Ever break your promise? I do this all the time. Like, I promise I'll be there to pick you up at two, and it's like three. Yeah, right? Like, mom, dad, can you promise pick me up? Ever have your parents forget you? Huh? Yeah, someone's like, yep. <laughs> like, I'm grateful I grew up in Eastern PI because my mom forgot me once at the Down East Mall in Montague, which is, shouldn't even have mall on it. But like she actually got in a car and drove away without me. And you might go, do you feel loved? I didn't in that moment. But God never drives away from me. Uh, and, and you're like, do you love your mom? Like, Yeah, I love her. She's awesome. But like, ever been for God, never feel for God, never go, I don't know if they really like me. I don't even know if they care for me. God does. He's there in those moments. He hasn't forsaken you. Oh, church, strength comes from knowing you're not abandoned, that God keeps his promises. Despite all that we have done, that have we would go, that fails him. Uh, that breaks his heart, but God is still there with us. When we have been wretched and 
faithless and our behavior doesn't line up to the way God would want it. Uh, the prophet Jeremiah is speaking just before the captivity to Babylon in the second chapter of Jeremiah. And this is why the Bible so raw and so real. He actually likens the people of Israel to a prostitute. It's very strong language. And yet in the third chapter, his arms are open. God's arms are open to the people. And he says this, if you come back, I will receive you. Like they are wandering. They're doing their own thing. And God's just saying, here I am. Like if you just wander, as you're wandering, know this, I'm, I'm here. I'll, I'll welcome you back. He says that the door will not be shut. He waits with open arms to receive those who repent, those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and they are changed. Like almost 11 years ago, we started Centerpoint Church, and we said we want our motto to be this at Centerpoint, come freely, leave change. Come as you are, but when you're here, we want you to encounter Jesus. Like, I'm not trying to trick you. I'm not trying to deceive you. If you're here today and you do not know Christ, I'm just being up front with you. You need him. We're not hiding that. So if someone invited you, if someone said, oh, you need to come here, it wasn't that they're trying to trick you. It was that they want you to hear about Jesus. We're not going to hide that. What you need is Christ. That's the purpose and the meaning of your life. It is Jesus. It is his person. It's his work. And that's what you need to grab onto. That's what you need to believe. So I'm not here to try to trick you with my words. I'm here to tell you we're all sinners and we need Jesus. And by the grace of God, some of us have been changed by him. So when you come in here today, come as you are, but my prayer, I'm not going to trick you here, is that you leave changed by Christ, that he's your savior, and you'll walk with him, and you'll honor him, and you'll love him. That's what the church should be about, encountering Jesus, living for Jesus, loving Jesus, walking with Jesus. So we say, come freely, leave changed. That's the kind of God we have. None of you are scraps. None of you are unworthy. None of you are insignificant. There's joy for you. Like God loves you. He's loved you from before the foundations of the world. That's what Nehemiah, that's what Ezra, that's what the priests, the Levites are conveying to these people. It's time to rejoice in God's love for you. And it comes from having something that is supremely worthwhile. What did this, these Israelites have? Like, think about it. They didn't have too much materially. Many of them didn't have a lot of money. They didn't have a lot of uh, material worth so they're on their net worth was on the low end they weren't seemingly now living in these great expensive uh, homes or even had a house in regards to it being the way we'd like it in terms of the things and the valuables of the world they probably had nothing at all but they had the assurance that they had fellowship with God and that was everything where does joy come from? Second thing, assurance of a relationship with God, and that was everything. Do you know, Center Point, when we have Jesus, uh, we have everything. Uh, do you enjoy Jesus? Thank you. All right, Kimberly. Like, think about, like, there's certain things in my life that bring me great enjoyment. Like, during COVID, when it hit last year, and we sort of were off to our own, by God, in his loving grace, uh, he, he led us to Holman's in Summerside. And I made so many trips to Holman's for ice cream. And, and I'd get three scoops in my bowl, and I would sit out there with my friends at the picnic table, and I would just, like, this is pure enjoyment. Like, this is, like, I think God brought heaven down to earth in this moment for me to taste that ice cream. It's so good. It's like, hey, what are you doing today? Well, do you want to go to Holman's? All right, let's go to Holman's. Uh, it's opening next month. I'm so excited. Like, I'm ready for it. Like, do you have anything in your life that brings you enjoyment? And if you know Christ, he should be the ultimate source of enjoyment. 
Like he should just wake you up and you should be like, I know maybe my life is hard. Maybe it's broken. Maybe it's tough. But man, Jesus is so worth it. I can enjoy Jesus in those hard times, those hard moments. Like if your joy is attached to material things, if your joy is in what's in your bank account, if your joy is in a relationship, if your joy is in the luxury of your home, if your joy is in your children, if your joy is in the food, if your joy is in what kind of car or truck you drive, if your joy is in what job you have, what if that was taken away from you? I remember being 23 years old, sitting in a pastor's office, just weeping and going, I I need help. I need help. And I remember in our conversation, uh, this pastor, he loved Jesus, he loved me, and he looked at me and he said, Howie, if God was to take everything you have away, would you be happy with only Jesus? And I remember just in my tears going, no. And he said, until Jesus becomes your everything, nothing will satisfy And for the next three months, I just spend time with God going, God, I want you to be my everything. This is what we need in our church. We need people who go, Jesus is my everything. If I lose everything and I have Jesus, I I still have it all. See, too often our hearts become so worldly. Too often we build our kingdom for this world and we miss out on the fact that Jesus actually is our everything that we live our life for his glory, that we live our life for the things of him. Like, can you say today, Jesus, you're all I need? Could you say to t- today, Jesus, you are my everything? Like, Jesus, you calm the storms. You give me rest. You hold me in your hands. You won't let me fall. You are the lifter of my head. You still my heart. You take my breath away. Like, God, If everyone abandons me, you still take me in. You take me deeper. You're all I want. You're all I need. Jesus, you are everything. Like, is that the cry of your heart? See, those are solid joys. Those are lasting treasures. And that's what I think Ezra is trying to tell these people, what Nehemiah and the Levites are trying to tell these people. Hey, hey, listen to me. You got everlasting treasure. Oh, center point. Imagine if we got that. I have everything. In 2 Peter, it says that Jesus has given me everything I I need to live a life of righteousness. I got it all in Christ. And yet we feel we're lacking. And yet we feel like we haven't got it. But Jesus goes, no, no, it's not about the experience. Some of us are just looking for experiences. Give me good experience. Give me good feeling. And and Jesus is going, "I, I gave you everything in the person of me. Obey me, walk with me, enjoy me, allow me to stretch you, allow me to grow you. See, it's not the treasure of material things. It's not the bling and the show of Babylon or Assyria or Greece or Rome in this passage. See this church. These people are tiny. They're insignificant in a way to the world. They're a little band of people in a small little city in the Middle East, but they have God. They have Jesus. They have the Spirit of God at work. And in a few days' time, they're going to stop and they're going to reflect and they're going to celebrate the Day of Atonement. And what a day that is. Uh, It would actually probably turn our stomachs to see that. Hundreds, perhaps on some occasion, occasions thousands of animals would be slaughtered ritually Uh, throats cut blood spilt the high priest would sprinkle the blood on the most holy place representative of the very presence of God to make atonement for the sins of God's people it would speak of the possibility that there is a way back to God from their sin from their despair and it's only through the shed blood it's only through the atonement it's only through propitiation it's only through substitution it's only through the satisfaction of that offering and acceptance of God and they would know what is the most exquisite thing imaginable to know. Here it is. My sins are forgiven. 
the best thing you could know today is this. My sins are forgiven. They have no weight on me. They have no dominion in my life. They are conquered. They are defeated. They are gone. He's wiped them away. He's made me new. I am renewed. I am a new creation. My sins are forgiven. Best thing you can know today is that. If you don't know it, you're missing out. But you could walk out of here today knowing my sins are forgiven. I'm set free. There are no chains on me. Yeah, I have some brokenness, but he turned that brokenness and that mess into his glory, into something for my good. He's that good. Is that the greatest thing you know today? My sins are forgiven. Oh, church, let it sink in. Like, I will stand before the throne of Jesus. And because he paid for my sins, he will not hold them against me. I'm free. I can start living that here on this earth. Like, like I'll still battle sin, but sin doesn't reign. reign. I'm indwelt by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit convicts me and he brings sin to the surface and he says get that right honor God live for God oh what a gift that conviction is what a gift that the spirit gives us because conviction should not lead to guilt and shame conviction should lead to celebration and joy that my savior has already paid for that and I am set free from that listen whatever it is you've done whatever dark spots there may be in your life in Jesus we are now white as snow Oh, that's good news. Joy comes from knowing that we have something that's supremely worthwhile. Third thing, uh, joy comes from knowing that our circumstances are actually ordered by God. Don't you think that as they stood there, that as they listened to God's word being read and preached, they looked around, they saw the familiar sights and scenes of the city of Jerusalem. The temple is before them. They knew that they were God's covenant people. God had ordered their steps. God had marched before them. They could say with assurance what Paul could say in Romans chapter 8, that all things work together for the good of those that love him. Do you think that in this crowd there were widows? Do you think that in this crowd there were orphans? Do you think in this crowd there were some people struggling with loneliness, with anxiety, with disease, with depression? Oh, there was. There was people in the crowd, but on this day, they were all united together. They were all going to be making much of Jesus and God and what the Spirit is doing together. But they knew this. God has ordered my steps. God has gone before me. But they could stand there collectively as the people of God and know the absolute truth and with certainty that God was actually ordering their lives. Do you believe that today, that God is planning your life, that you make decisions and choices and somehow God has orchestrated it all, that he is sovereign over all things, and as you walk this earth, God's got a plan for you? That's so good that if you walk in his ways and obey him, you'll just follow into that. Like he is ordering your steps. And this is God's plan here. There's purpose here. And on this day, something of the mystery of the unfolding purposes of God was clear to them. And they just rejoice in it. They start to celebrate it. Like do you celebrate and worship God in your pain? In your suffering? In your brokenness. God has ordained that. Oh, are they hard? Absolutely. I'm not downplaying it. I'm not telling you there isn't going to be tears and just wipe your tears away. Oh, no. You can praise him while you're crying. You can praise him while you're weeping. You just keep walking with him through those storms, through those seasons. Because God is allowing those things to mature you, to grow you, to make you more like Jesus. What joy it is to know that whatever is happening, no matter how dark things might seem, no matter how they look on the surface, that God orders all things for his own purpose and for our good. The joy comes from an awareness that the best is yet to come. So, this is good here, all right? This, this is going to preach. You know, as they stood there on that day, I, I just stop and I wonder, like, did they begin to reflect on what 
the purpose of God might be. Not only that there was a purpose, but what that purpose was. Some of them, I imagine, as, as they read the law, they might have thought about like Genesis chapter 1, like uh, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And that, like, how can you even get past the first 10 words? Like, in the beginning, God? Think about that. And we have all these questions, right? Like, was God creative? Was God from the, like, and your mind starts going, and you're like, how could you even get past the first 10 words? And they hear scripture being read. And then they hit Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, where, where God promises that the seed of the woman will actually come and crush Satan's head. And they're like, oh, this is good. Like, preach, preacher. Like, go, Ezra. Like, zone in on that. Focus on, what, what do you mean? Crushing the serpent's head. Oh, oh, God's going to send the Messiah, and Satan is no match for him. He'll strike his heel, but the Messiah will crush his head. So hear me. At the cross, Jesus died and was buried. Satan struck his heel. But on the third day, he rose. Death gone. Sin, no more power. Satan, crushed. Genesis 3.15, what many refer to as the first gospel. And the people are at the water gate and they're hearing that. And I'm sure hope's stirring in them. They're going, oh, we've got it. We've got the greatest treasure there is. Preach it, Ezra, preach it. And they reflect on their history and how God brought them out of the Exodus and all through their through ancient history of Israel and Judah right down to this very moment. And perhaps it begins to dawn on them. And I imagine some of them, uh, as, they, as they stand there, they thought of how God brought them back to Jerusalem at this very location for this reason, that through them... Uh, that through them Jesus would actually come, that the Messiah would come through this line of people, that he would come down. And then we read all through that, that Jesus was announced by, or that Gabriel, the, the angel, showed up to Zechariah and Elizabeth and announced the forerunner to Jesus, John the Baptist, and that he goes to Mary and he tells Mary, hey, you're going to have a son and you're going to name him Jesus. Like, just picture this. This is how it all comes down. And this is amazing. See, joy comes comes in knowing that the best is yet to come. You're going through some hard times, the best is yet to come. You feel broken, the best is yet to come. How you don't understand what people have done to me, what they've committed against me, the best is yet to come. Jesus will not let that go unattended. Jesus will bring justice to all our circumstances and our situations. Church, the best is yet to come. Like why live for this world? That's lame sauce. It is. It's so lame. Like building our kingdom here, living in this world, going, oh man, you know, if I had this much money, then I'd be happy. Or if I had this boy, or if I had this girl, like, like, come on. To Jesus? Compared to Jesus? Compared to what he offers? The best is yet to come. I can't wait. Like, if Jesus came back today, I wouldn't be like, oh man, you should have waited a little while. I'd be like, Yes! This is what I've been living for. This is what I've been longing for. I want Jesus to come, like come today. I'm ready, come. But, but the Leafs didn't win the cup yet, Howie, chill. Oh no, Jesus, come for eternity. We'll mock, no, I'm just joking. We'll move on now. The best is yet to come. And here's where joy should ultimately lead. And it's our final point. Jesus is coming again. He's coming again. Because joy for us is not just in looking back, not just living in the present. It's remembering, yeah, Jesus did come. He came to Bethlehem. Uh, he went to the cross. He was buried. He rose from the grave. But man, we go further. Like someday the clouds are going to break and he's coming again. 
Like, that should excite you. Like, I woke up today thinking about this, and I'm like, oh, I, I need to read this. It's Revelation 19, uh, verses 11 to 16. We forget this all the time. But here, here's Jesus. Then I saw heaven, and, and then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called faithful. He's called true. And in righteousness, he judges and makes war. Get this. His eyes are like a flame of fire. And on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe, dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth, this is so cool, this is the Jesus who's showing up. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fur, uh, fury of the wrath of God the Almighty and on his robe and on his thigh. So he has a tattoo here in this picture. This is cool. He has a name written King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Like he's going to come. He's going to break through the clouds. The best is yet to come. Jesus is coming again. He's coming on the clouds of heaven this time. He's coming as the king of kings this time. He's coming as the Lord of lords. He's coming in splendor. He's coming in glory. He's coming to bring in the reality of the new heavens and the new earth. Are you ready to see him? Are you ready to meet him? Are you ready to come with him as he ushers in his kingdom? Like, are you ready for that parade? That's the one we're looking for. That's the one we want. And there is. There, there's heaven. There's glory. Like, new heavens, new earth. Like, no more sickness, no more pandemics, no more wearing masks and just looking at eyes. Like there's coming a day, no more sin, no more sadness, no more tears, no more sorrow, no more grief. There's coming a day. Are you ready? Are you looking forward to it? And then you're going to see him. You're going to look on his face like, like I, I just can't wait to look upon the face of Jesus. I can't wait. I just want to see him. I just want to be with him in his kingdom. See, joy comes from the assurance that we are loved. Joy comes from having something that is supremely worthwhile, and that is only Jesus. Joy comes from knowing that our circumstances are ordered by God. Joy comes by knowing that the best is yet to come. You know when you have that assurance, that's powerful. Like you walk around, not with arrogance, but with confidence. Not in confidence of how you lived, but in confidence of what Jesus has done. Like that gives you some backbone. That makes you stand up and you just go, I can't wait for Jesus to return. I can't wait to just honor him today and live for him today and obey him today. Like I can't wait to read his word, to grow, to know him more. That gives you strength, come what may. Come sickness, come betrayal, come disease, come abandonment come death, come unknowns, come loss, come pain, whatever it is, we are God's. We are held by him, and no man can pluck us out of his hand. He holds us. We are secure in him. We have everything we want. We're on the Lord's side. Nothing and no one can separate us from the love of God if we're found in Jesus. It is all through Christ. The joy of the Lord is our strength. So we don't boast about how awesome we are. Hey, I'm going to fast for 21 days. I'm so awesome. Oh, no. I'm going to fast for 21 days so I can encounter my beautiful Savior, so that he can uh, renew my heart, so that he can take out stuff that, that isn't honoring him. I'm doing that. My heart between God. I want to do that. I didn't come to church today to win his favor or love. I came to church today because he just loves me anyways. And I just want to be here because I know Jesus will be talked about. I know Jesus will be magnified. That Jesus will be lifted up and we'll see the beauty of Christ. That's why I come. I come to make much of Jesus. I come to encourage my brothers and my sisters in the Lord. That just doesn't happen on Sunday. And during the week, I just go crazy. If someone's on my heart, I 
pray for them. If someone's on my heart, I, I dial their number. I call them. I send them a text message. I send them an inbox message. Whatever it is, I am going to encourage them because the battle's raging, but I know through Jesus we've won the battle. Okay? That's all I got for you. We're going to pray. We're going to sing. Heavenly Father, thank you for the hope of the gospel. Thank you for the beauty of the gospel. And God, I don't know if there's anyone in this room today who doesn't know you, but I pray that your spirit right now would open up their heart, their mind to your beauty, to your truth, that you love them so much, Jesus. You hung on a cross. Your body was broken. Your blood was shed. You did it for them. Not only that, you were buried and you rose again. And you conquered death, you conquered sin, you conquered Satan. And God, if we're found in you today, if we know Jesus as our Savior, uh, we just need to praise you more. We need to have so many praise parties, no matter what situation and circumstance we are in, and just make much of you. We, we want to enjoy you. We want to obey you. We want to walk with you. So let our hearts follow down that road. I pray as we, as we close today that, that your spirit would save people right now in the truth of the gospel. I pray for the Christian who's wandering, that they would just be drawn back to the heart of the gospel, that they do not walk in guilt they do not walk in shame because on the cross you died for that on the cross you set them free so God my prayer is that you would bring freedom to the Christian's life because they're already marked by freedom enough of allowing Satan to kill destroy and rob we're going to stand on the fact that the best is yet to come life is broken but Jesus is going to fix it all he's awesome in his name we pray amen